writing stories, there's always a bit of magic in it. I never know where that next story is going to come. It just pops up out of the air. Feels like, you know, you're getting struck by lightning or something. It's not planned. It's not like I sit down and say, I'm going to write a book about Driven Capote and Harper Lee. It's like, I have no idea. I believe everybody has a story we're telling. I also believe that in the South, y'all have a hundred stories worth telling. And the thing I love the most is to plant myself in a new city and hear those stories and hear those histories behind a place and to meet people I never would have met before and to hear their stories too. It's kind of the great Southern tradition of storytelling. The actor Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away kind of unexpectedly and I was a fan of his work, and I did what most fans do. You know, you start to watch some of their old movies. And the first movie I started with was his Oscar-winning portrayal as Truman Capote in the movie Capote. So there's Truman in Kansas in 1959 with his best friend, Harper Lee. And they're trying to solve this small town murder. And then it comes out that they were childhood friends and that they grew up as next door neighbors in the middle of this small town in Southern Alabama during the Great Depression. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? what was that? Two of our greatest writers grew up as next door neighbors in this small rural town. Where's that book? And what was it about that town called Monroeville that produced two of our greatest writers? You have to picture the Great Depression kids sometimes going to school barefoot and here's this kid in his fancy little white outfit tie and his white shoes and imagine that kid going to school and you know he was a target for bullies and who would come to his rescue but the girl next door who was kind of the ultimate tomboy they kind of bonded over a mutual love of detective novels. They would often pretend to be Sherlock and Watson, and together they would team up to solve these small town cases. I wanted to read that book so bad, I decided to write it. So that became, you know, True and Nell. There are many, many, many events in my book that are based on their actual lives, and you can directly see how they translated two scenes in To Kill a Mockingbird or The Grass Harp. So for me to actually be here in Monroeville three weeks after my book has come out is pretty special. It's kind of like walking into my novel. Wow, this is pretty amazing to be in this room because this room is the central location from To Kill a Mockingbird. This is the table that Atticus Finch, the most beloved character in all of fiction, sat to defend his case. And in real life, which is what my book is based on, this is the room where Nell's father, A.C. Lee, worked. He often sat here and would walk on these floors to defend his clients. And Nell and True would often sit up in that balcony and watch the proceedings. She often said it was more entertaining than the picture shows. But I think really watching these cases is where they developed a, a love of detective novels and crime uh, that would lead them throughout their lives. Believe it or not, this is the actual street that True and Nell lived on, and it looks probably a little different than you thought it did from the book. There used to be red dirt roads all along here, and all that's left of Truman's house is pretty much an empty lot. The house burned down mysteriously shortly after Truman moved. But there still remains part of the foundation right here, and that's the cool part, where you can actually see things that were in the book. This is the pond from the monster fish and the two-headed chicken short story that Jenny had built for her goldfish, but Truman soon took it over, not only for the monster fish, but he would actually charge kids to come and swim in this rather opulent swimming hole. 
Right over here are the twin chinaberry trees that legend would have you believe is where they built their tree house. So this is the actual wall that Nell is balancing on in the story. And they would both do acrobatic feats off of it. Truman in particular was a gymnast, so he loved to do cartwheels and whatnot on this wall. So even beyond like the bricks and mortar that we saw are the fact that the plants and flowers that Jenny herself planted are still here. And you can come up here and pick a flower and smell it and know that these are the actual flowers that Truman would smell around the property. Just like Truman's house is no longer here, unfortunately, Nell's house is no longer here either. And it has been replaced by Mel's dairy dream. So you can no longer find any evidence that she lived here, uh, but you can't have an ice cream. I'm gonna get the Boo Radley shake. I heard that's pretty good. When I first started writing, I remembered all of those marvelous stories that Jennings Carter had told me about his childhood with Truman Capote and Nell Harper Lee. I had about 15 of these precious stories, which I then incorporated uh, into my book, Truman Capote's Southern Years. There was a lot of isolation here, and their imagination was fed. They were read to, they were encouraged to read, to act, to play. They were encouraged to write. And maybe that's why we need such wonderful models. You know, if we get an opportunity to meet a writer and talk to a writer, then it makes us think, well, okay, that's a real person. Maybe I can do that too. I visit a lot of schools and I know a lot of kids who read To Kill a Mockingbird. And I love the idea that perhaps this book could be an introduction to that story. One of the things that kids want to know the most when I talk is, you know, the story behind the story. And they love it when they find out a story actually happened in a real place and is based on real people or real incidents. And then they start talking, you know, it's a way to weave into actual history of the 20th century, of the Great Depression, of, you know, Jim Crow, and all these issues come out. It's kind of humbling seeing the Harper Lee site and to know for all her celebrity and all millions and all the attention she ends up in a plain simple grave this is Atticus Finch right here and then just to go back and then see like Sonny the Boo Radley character is based on him makes it real this is Nanny Rumbly Falk otherwise known as Sook Truman's favorite cousin and the one that took care of him Everybody's here somewhere. When Truman first spotted Nell, he thought she was a boy. She was watching him like a cat perched up on a crooked stone wall that separated their rambling wood homes. Barefoot and dressed in overalls with a boyish haircut, Nell looked to be about his age, but it was hard for Truman to tell. He was trying to avoid her stare by pretending to read his book. Hey, you, she finally said. Truman gazed up from his pages. He was sitting quietly on a wicker chair on the side of the porch of his cousin's house, dressed in a little white sailor suit. Are you talking to me? He said in a high, wispy voice. Come here, she commanded. Truman pulled on his cowlick and glanced across the porch to the kitchen window. Inside, Sook, his second cousin, was prepping her secret drops of medicine. Everybody's favorite ham. <laughs>